When Mary Beth and I moved to North Hollywood, we took part in what I like to refer to as the Great North Hollywood Refrigerator Swap. Um, um, okay. Andrea remembers part of it. Um, so Mary Beth and I had, we came to North Hollywood with two refrigerators. We like to have two because we send up a lot of food and buy in bulk, and so we usually have one in a garage if we have it. Well, this place came with a refrigerator, and so um, we didn't have need of one of them. Well, the Pongos moved shortly after us, and I think your place didn't come with a refrigerator, right? No, it didn't. And so we're like, oh, cool, we have a, an extra refrigerator. I think it's ours in your place, right? Yeah, the black one. And then, um, so our ice maker breaks in the one that came with this place, and we were like, oh, shoot, you know, kind of thinking, oh, we get Pongos our <laughs> we can't use our ice. Yeah, we don't have to hook up for it. Um, anyway, but so around that time, uh, the Moonies were also moving in a few doors down here, and they were bringing a refrigerator because their place didn't have one. And the um, spot for the refrigerator to go in their kitchen, their fridge that they brought was too big. They needed a smaller refrigerator. Well, our other refrigerator was a smaller size and so it fit perfectly in their place and so now we have the refrigerator that they brought here at our place right now and the refrigerator that came with this place out in the garage and so um, it's kind of funny because um, and, and then somewhere in there there was some other like I remember moving a refrigerator with Mark Leduc and with um, I think the um, the winters made, or sent, there was like other refrigerators just being swapped around. I don't even know how, where everything ended up. Uh, but I know that at the end, like we all had kind of the refrigerators that we wanted and that we needed. And, um, so that's the great North Hollywood refrigerator swap. Um, and I, I think like, well, why did all of that go down? And I think it relates a little in a small way to our passage today. It really wasn't because, um, we were the best of friends because we at that point we're still getting to know each other's new relationship to us um, Now we're all the best of friends. I mean just the best <laughs> um, But really that was that was going down largely in part to the fact that we We were and we are together in something or together in what we believe or together in what we feel like the Lord is leading us to here in North Hollywood and I think that really uh, describes our, oh, in a small way, again, our passage today. I don't want to try to compare it to what we're going to read today. But um, hopefully I made it clear last week that the book of Acts and even the, the rest of the New Testament isn't meant to be a, a blueprint for uh, what the church, what church life is supposed to look like. Um, Otherwise, we'd be speaking in Greek too, and or, you know, there's there's lots of things that that we read in Scripture, and we um, uh, we don't model exactly after, but nevertheless, it's really valuable insight into what God was doing. Like we can look at the beginning of the church and see what was God doing at the beginning of Christianity. What was the church doing? And usually, at the beginning of an organization or um, something starting up, when you look at the beginning, you see a really true kind of idea of at least what they were valuing, what the what the mission was, what they were going for, because it's like, that's, that's the reason it, it began. And so um, it's cool that we can look into Acts 2 and kind of see how they started, how the church started, what was important to them to begin with uh, from the start. And we saw last week <clears throat> that at this, most maybe the most exciting time in church history when the local church in Jerusalem goes from 120 people one day to later that day 3,000 people, um, which is pretty amazing. This revival breaking out, miracles are happening, and it says that that what what they were doing in verse 42 we looked at last week they devoted themselves all those 3,120 people I guess um, devoted themselves to two things specifically that Luke mentions, um, the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And we said that it, it, it looks like 
it, he may break down the fellowship into two other elements, the breaking of bread and the prayers. Um, but that's what those people were, that's what their practices um, looked like. And to us, maybe we have, it's cool because we have some similar practices. We're devoted to some similar things. For us, the apostles' teaching, I mean, that, that means God's word for us. It's his, this revealed truth to us. Um, and the fellowship, we have, we have fellowship in many different ways, um, hopefully as a church. But even as we saw last week, there's these, um, uh, uh, it's a definite article, I think it's called, for, for the apostles teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, the prayers, as if it's even, it's an, a specific activity. It's not just fellowship and breaking bread, but like a specific <coughs> thing. So, the Lord's Supper, it seems, and the fellowship, maybe this ongoing regular activity and the apostles' teaching certainly was a regular thing. And so it's not just these ideas of, well, we should be committed, as our church says, to truth and to love, but actually committed to some, some of the feet to those values in some of the gatherings. Um, and for us here, like, like you guys know, that looks like kind of some of our, or our two main gatherings are midweek teaching here tonight and then our Sunday fellowship meals. Um, so that's we talked about that last week and we'll go on now. Um, maybe somebody could read Acts 2, 42 to 47. Somebody besides Shalaria, because you read it last week, Shalaria. So 242 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and all thing, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their home, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, I love this. Um, just quickly, possessions and belongings. They were selling their possessions and belongings um, and, uh, what's it say? and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Possessions and belongings, those two words, they kind of mean different things. Possessions is more like um, fixed um, asset like real estate primarily possessions and then belongings are like personal things that you own so like from from big ownership of things they were selling to little personal items that they were selling so uh, when I first started kind of thinking about this passage in college um, I remember being pumped because I was like a Francis Chan freak and like Let's like we need to be extreme, and this sounds extreme. And um, I think that uh, everybody in the church should sell everything that they own, and we should all live together, and we should all share a bank account. And um, and can, the non-believing world would be blown away, and it'd be evidence that our faith is true. And this is what we must do as a church, because it says right here that's what the early church did. We need to be just like them. Um, do did, did y'all ever have that, like, have you had that time in your life, or maybe that's now, when you're just like, hey, this, you know, you feel me on that a little bit? Like, that sounds great. And then you realize once you get into it, maybe it's um, a little more difficult than you thought. Um, in time, and after some more study and hearing thoughts from others, I've slowed the train down a little bit on... Um, as far as making this a model of what churches need to do. Um, So first I just want to take a bit of time to look at what this passage doesn't say, that on my initial college readings I was was just assuming, well this is is what we need to do. Um, And I'll just start by saying I don't think that we learn from this passage that every ideal local church needs to start a commune and share a bank account Mm -hmm. and um, as much as the adventurous Christian inside of me wants to do that um, I don't think that that's necessarily what it's calling us to Um, 
and I'll tell you why. I'll give you a few reasons. There's probably more, but um, and, and there's a similar passage it, to this in Acts four that says some very similar things about selling their possessions. Um, first of all, they don't. It, it doesn't talk about. Um, it doesn't teach against household government or or ownership of things as an individual or as a family. So it wasn't like there was something wrong with, oh, to just use a modern day example, for me to say, well, this is, this is my TV. I own this TV. And it's not saying that, well, Jake is part of this church, so it's just as much his TV, and so he can decide what he, can, he wants to do with the TV just as much as I can decide. It's not teaching against personal ownership of something. Now, of course, you could blow that back and say, well, everything belongs to God. But you guys understand, like, it's, nowhere does it say that people didn't have their own possessions. And in fact, it talks of some people still later on in the gospel that they, they did have their own homes. And there was, they, some had their own possessions. It wasn't um, that, that nobody owned anything. Or it wasn't that everything had shared ownership. One uh, commentator, Richard Longenecker, um, <laughs> says, says they lived in their own homes, and he gives a couple references, and had their own possessions as any household would. But these early Christians had personal, po oh, though these early Christians had personal possessions, they did not consider them to be private possessions, to be held exclusively for their own use and enjoyment. Rather, they shared what they had and so expressed their corporate life. So the way that they were living didn't mean that they all owned everything together. Um, and, and it didn't necessarily mean that they all had an exactly equal amount. Um, this, isn't, this doesn't teach, as we think about it, socialism or communism that's, that's a kind of imposed thing. But this is it's voluntary. If you read through the New Testament, you see that giving, and even in this book of Acts, it's extreme giving. It's, it's voluntary, and it doesn't mean that everybody was, was doing these things to this extreme. Um, in fact, in chapter 4 and 5, it talks about two examples of people who sold things. Um, Barnabas, in Acts 4, he sold a field, and he laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet. It's kind of mentioned like, well, here's a, here's a special case that we can look at of Barnabas, and wow, that's really cool. And then it talks about Ananias and Sapphira, who also sold some land. Um, what's the story with Ananias and Sapphira? You know? They lied, no. about, what's they that? lied about how much they sold it for <clears throat> to keep some to themselves, and they were struck dead. Yeah, so, uh, right. So it wasn't, that they didn't die because, but like at first when you read that, it seems kind of harsh. It's like, well, at least they sold land and gave <laughs> some to the church, right? But, um, and, and Peter even tells them, it's like, while you owned the land, it was it was yours to do with whatever you wanted. And even with the proceeds, you could do whatever you wanted. The problem was that they kind of fudged the numbers and made it look like maybe they were more generous than they were when really they kept back some for themselves. Um, but the, one point is they could have chosen not to give at all. It wasn't that that was something that they, that they had to do. It wasn't imposed on everybody. So um, in 2 Corinthians 8, um, Paul talks about the uh, Macedonian, the generosity of the Macedonian churches, um, and which I think is Philippi and Thessalonica. Um, they, it says, he says of them, they gave according to their means. It's talking about a collection that they took for another church. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, and here's what he says about how they gave, of their own accord, so like as, as they decided to do and wanted to do, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. This is something they really wanted to do, and they're begging Paul and others, how can we be a part of this work? So this is definitely not something that, that the early churches felt, you have to do this, um, but it's something that they desire to do. Um, later, Paul talks to the Corinthian church about their, he commends them for their desire to give and that their readiness to give was there. So, um, so it's not um, socialism per se, 
um, it, at least in the way that we tend to take it. Another thing is, and this is very important with a lot of scripture to consider, but this early church that we're reading of in Acts 2 had some very special circumstances historically that they were living in. Okay, so for example, some of the people maybe that needed help in, in finance that were in need were some apostles who had literally left their livelihood to follow Jesus. And so there's a unique need that comes about from that. Um, also, in the time, there was a, there was a, a poverty in the area um, that didn't, it, it was a poverty that didn't provide people the opportunity that 21st century America does. Um, as far as help, like there was, there, there may have been no help and the poverty was maybe more significant, not to minimize those in need in America, but, um, but it was a, a different historical situation where it was even a, a more vast um, issue, if you will. Another thing is people are coming to Jerusalem from all over the place, from days and days and days and days journeys away to Jerusalem for Passover, and because of the, the work that God's doing, the amazing thing that he's doing, they're staying there away from their homes, and so you can see this just creates more immediate need. There's a bunch of people there that probably live in other places, and so there's food and shelter and whatever that they need. So they have special circumstances. When looking in scripture, it's important to um, distinguish between what's uh, between what's historical and what's um, what is entirely transparent to us. I think is how the scholars describe it. It's it, it's if there there's historicity to everything, meaning this took place in a unique time and place, which means it's not going to look exactly the same for somebody living in the time and place that we do. Um, on the other hand, there's certain things in scripture that were, there's like a one-for-one -one correlation where it's like, well, that's transparent for us too. We can set our lives on top of that and say we, we do the exact same things. Um, but there's certainly something uniquely historic, uniquely going on here historically in the early church. So there's a few um, ideas about why we may not need to try as a church to do this exact thing. Now, here's what happens though. I read a lot of commentators and I've heard people teach on this passage. And what often happens is because of those things, um, we try to, or I've heard it tried to explain away the significance of what was happening here and to make it seem like well, because it was that time and place, well, that's not significant to us anymore. Like, that's just a unique thing that was happening, so it's, it's not relevant to me. Like, don't worry, you don't have to live in this way. And God isn't saying you have to live this extremely. And so then everybody <coughs> listening to that just breathed this big sigh of relief, and they're like, oh, thank goodness, because that would be really hard to live that way. And I'm just glad I'm not living in that context. And, um, and do you, do you see what happens there? And it becomes like this excuse to not have to demonstrate uh, a faith like these people demonstrated. And that's the last thing that I want to do. So instead of li like just looking at um, reasons why we don't have to live that way, and what the passage doesn't say, I want to look at what it does say, what it does actually show us. And here's what it says in verse 45. This is what it does say. These these early Christians, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And can we stop for just a second and say, wow, like that is incredible. That's really cool. These people are so committed to their newfound faith that they've decided it would be good to do this extreme caring for one another and it seems to be presented by the writer as a positive thing, right? Um, so uh, regardless of the historical circumstances, this is a crazy way to live that took massive faith and commitment to Jesus. Like, can we say that and not, not try to just um, belittle <laughs> what was going on in any way? It, it would be really weird to to make that seem unimportant as if 
in those early disciples' lives, selling their homes and possessions and everything was not a big deal to them. No, that was, this is huge, okay? And um, it'd be like if, you can, if you're talking about like somebody who is martyred for, you know, a, a Christian who's killed for their faith, and like, um, well, that's just, that's not important. That's just what they had to face, and that's not relevant to me. Uh, they had a gun to their head. I don't have a gun to my head, so that's not the way that I have to live. That's not what we do. We say, wow, that, that person, I'm inspired by that person's faith, and I want to have a, a, a boldness that's like that kind of boldness in whatever context that I'm in. And so there's plenty of things, like I was saying, that we read in Scripture that we don't have to uh, replicate exactly but we also don't have to, to throw them out and consider them irrelevant because of their historical context. So, um, these Christians, the, the first church, understood that there was something more important going on than their own investments and their comfort in life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a message that we can make application from. So, I'll ask you guys this question. Why do you think, what led these people to decide to do these things? Besides that the, the need was there, why would they actually live that way? Why would they think it's a good idea to do that? What do you think? One thought I had would be that um, a lot of the things, it says many signs and wonders were be being done mm -hmm. through the apostles, mm -hmm. and then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Mm -hmm. Like what you said about people coming in from a lot of other places for the Passover, yeah. just prior to that. Maybe they wanted to stay around the apostles. They wanted to stay around where the church was. They had no mm -hmm. context for leaving and, and going home yet. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. they they probably saw the need to um, you know to help each other out because they were all in that in that situation together, and many of the people in Jerusalem were in that situation. And seeing these converts and having they they wanted to show love to them and connect with them. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. um. I was uh, thinking <clears throat> many of them have been followers of Jesus before, um, and so I'm sure they heard him when he sh said to the rich dude about the camel and the slave possessions. I might be confused with stories. Um, but um, having heard that or heard Jesus talk about... Oh, you're talking about the rich young mm -hmm. ruler who Jesus said yeah. sell everything you own. Yeah, um, but I'm sure there was more than just the whatever scriptures yeah. that were shared with us to that, and I'm sure there were more stories and conversations about that generosity yeah. that Jesus personally shared. Sure, that they, they wanted to Yeah, they heard and they wanted to implement. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There's there's a call of, of giving and selflessness in multiple ways that yeah Jesus taught. And, so they thought, well, this makes sense that we did something yeah, under that. Yeah. Oh, um, <clears throat> I wasn't raising my hand, but I did have a thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> it says, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs um, were being done through the apostles, <clears throat> and all coming upon your soul, like, that feels good. Yeah. Um, that's really satisfying and fulfilling, and to have... Um, just a front row seat to the numbers being added to them every day and how encouraging it is when people come to the faith and accept Jesus as their Lord. Like, that's fulfilling, and it's going to encourage the, that lifestyle and that commitment of selling your possessions, having all things in common, gathering together. Um, so, I mean, that's why I would have done it. <coughs> I love, I think you, that's all sounds right to me. Um, I love in verse 44 um, what it says b before the part that I get taken with. Um, it says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And if you look at the, 
the Greek of that word together, it's a phrase actually of a couple words um, that's the commentators say it's very hard to translate. But at the very least, it means more than together in proximity, like they were all together, all 3,000 of them. But there was, they were associated together somehow. Or they were, you could say, with or, or for each other. They were together in unity. So um, in the, a parallel passage in Acts 4 I mentioned earlier, there's a verse, chapter 4, verse 32, which says something very similar to this verse. It says, now the full number of those who believed were, instead of together, it says, were of one heart and soul. And it goes on like this verse, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So this, this idea of together, I think, is critical, and I think Luke goes on to kind of explain it with that one heart and soul. So... When you're on the same team as someone, you want to do them well because your goals or your mission is the same. And when they rejoice, you rejoice. And in this case, their mission or their goals that has been set before them is, is um, making disciples. They'll be witnesses to the ends of the earth. And I... I think we can see that it makes sense that the more togetherness people share, the more unity that's shared, the more we understand we're on the same team, the more our hands kind of open up to each other and what we have. Unity kind of gives way to, to charity and generosity. Um, another commentator said, this pooling of property, he calls it, could be maintained voluntarily only when their sense of spiritual unity was exceptionally active. So they're, they're so unified that, that they agree and commit to something like this. And he goes on to say, as soon as the flame began to burn a little lower, that unity dies down a little bit, the attempt to maintain the communal life was beset with serious difficulties. And this isn't something that continued on for a long time in the church, um, but it was, it was short-lived. So. When you're in complete unity, there's this attitude of what's mine is yours, right? And it makes sense to give to somebody in need. It's like an assist in basketball or hockey. It's like, I could take this shot, um, or I could pass it off to this person, and they could make the shot. And either way, we get the point, and maybe actually they're going to be better off, they have a better position or whatever to make that. But it's, it's that idea. Instead of me having to get that or do that, it's, it can be passed on to somebody else. And that's what you do in team sports, right? Because you're together. And um, in the early church, it seems like, as you read through the book of Acts, that their, their mission together of, of the gospel and the proclamation of the gospel was more important than their stuff. And I don't think that's something that we can just like write off as an irrelevant first century uh, type of thing because of poverty that they lived in, but I think our application can actually be um, very similar. Does it mean something to us that our mission, the mission of the gospel, ought to be more important than our stuff? Can we make application out of that? Um, Albert Barnes says this, and I agree, at least I feel, I feel what he's explaining here. The love of property is one of the strongest affections, he says, which men have. There's nothing that will overcome it, but he says religion. I think he's speaking Christianly, a belief in something greater that will overcome it. One of the first effects of the gospel, he says, was to loosen the hold of Christians on property. It just becomes less important now that I'm understanding the gospel and what Jesus has accomplished, his resurrection. And I wonder if the gospel has affected our lives in a similar way so that our hands open to the people around us. Um, and the reason that this kind of countercultural living was taking place was not just because God was working in them individually to make them more generous individuals. But I think we see hints here that it was he was forming unity among them based on their togetherness in 
the gospel. And, and together, this idea of together is highlighted in these six verses we look at. We see this word fellowship back in verse 42. Well, fellowship has a real sense of, of togetherness. We said last week it, it, it's like um, partnership with each other, or working together in something. And then in our verse 44 here today, they were together. Uh, in verse 46, they were attending temple together. That's, again, not just, it's a different word as together in verse 44, but it's not just uh, together like they all went in one big herd together, but they were attending temple with the same mind, um, with the same heart in doing those things. So, so all over, even these few verses, there's a sense of togetherness that I think leads them into this, what seems to be an extreme lifestyle of just being willing to sell my home or my extra whatever I have in order to meet somebody else's need. Um, so I want to kind of ask uh, the question, and we could probably think of a bunch of things to answer this. Um, I'll mention four. But what, what kills this kind of togetherness or unity? Because it's really hard, I think, to achieve and, and maintain. And I don't think this came easily. First of all, I think pride kills togetherness, right? Maybe, obviously. They, because then you think, well, they don't deserve my help. I've worked hard at getting this, and why should I give up what I've worked hard to get? Or, you know, as if that was entirely done by ourselves and God didn't give us the ability to actually get what we have. Um, or even the, there's probably pride the other way to say, well, I deserve what you have. I've worked hard, and I deserve to have something that this, you know, I, I deserve to have more, and that person doesn't deserve to have it. Um, side note, I'm sure maybe it was a common phrase in this early church, what's mine is yours. I, I don't think the attitude is what's yours is mine. Does that make sense? Um, that it was, again, it was a voluntary thing of the people that had more giving to those who were in need, but it wasn't necessarily those in need just demanding, hey, I need to have what you have, what's mine, what's mine is yours. Um, or what's yours is mine, rather. Um, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> pride, I think, kills togetherness. Another thing that kills togetherness is laziness. Um, I'll just read a, several verses from Second Thessalonians. Um, so it says, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you... Keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It's not because we don't have the right, but... Um, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. So um, it, it doesn't make sense for a lazy person to have dumped on them all of the hardworking people's stuff. I mean, to be blunt. Laziness, it kills unity. So to go back to the sports team example, like maybe you've been on a team where there's, a, there's some person who's not pulling their end, not just because they're crummy at, at the sport, but they're, just, they're not hustling like they ought to be. And that affects the whole team, and it brings the morality of the, morale of the team down, and um, it, it kills the unity of the team. Another verse I think relevant to it is Ephesians 4.28. It says, um, Paul says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, I love this, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So it's not just that everyone should work hard so that if possible, if the Lord allows it, they could cover their own bills, but you could even work with the hope that you might be able to actually help to meet the needs of somebody else. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, but when laziness gets in there, it 
it, it messes with that togetherness and the application of this. So uh, another thing, lack of faith kills togetherness. So you're afraid, maybe, that God might not provide what you need, and so you hold more tightly to the things that you have. And um, to that, Jesus would say, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Seek first the kingdom of God, which might involve meeting the needs of other people, and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But when we have a lack of faith that that's true, that can, that can kill the, the type of togetherness, I think, that he calls us to in the gospel. Paul tells the Philippian church, who gave him a, a gift, I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift he sent. And he tells them, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And then Paul, when he's encouraging the Corinthian church to be generous, he says, I don't mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need and that there may be fairness. As it is written, he says, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever, whoever gathered little had no lack. So he's referring to the Israelites in uh, in the wilderness, when God was providing manna, bread from heaven, and some would gather a little bit more than they needed, and some would gather a little bit less than they needed, but when all was said and done, God worked it out so everybody had exactly what they needed. And that's the picture that Paul gives the Corinthians to say, hey, meet somebody's need, because in time they're going to be able to meet your need. Um, so maybe maybe that's you, um, that there's a, a, a lack of faith that God knows what we need even before we ask um, and, and we'll provide what we truly need or maybe if you don't lack that faith and you're still like holding tightly to what you have then we're talking about another unity killer which is greed right mm -hmm. it's not just I don't believe he'll provide but um, I just desire more and I want more of some temporal uh, short lasting riches than maybe what God has to offer I heard, I was with a friend last night that said, um, his wife jokingly likes to tell him, hey Dan, remember, what's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. <laughs> that was, okay. But greed kills togetherness. Like that doesn't, that doesn't work to bring togetherness. Uh, lack of faith, greed, um, laziness, or, or, or idleness, um, and and pride. We could mention other things, but all those things tear down and destroy um, the, the unity and togetherness that I think is being described here. So what produces that sense of togetherness? I think the only thing that we can say that produces biblical togetherness, to use this term, is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ that we find in him, that we all share in together. I don't think that what these early Christians, I don't think that this cool thing in verse 44 and 45 happened because somebody said, hey, I think it'd be really cool to develop a commune together. Wouldn't that be kind of hipster and neat? Or because I don't think it was somebody just wanted to do like some team building exercise where we can really just um, show that we're a good team if we do this. But I believe that what led to their extreme togetherness was the subject of their unity, which was the gospel of Christ, which they'd just very recently seen in the resurrection of Jesus and all that that entails. So I, I think we as a church experience a good deal of unity. I've sensed that. And there's ways that that happens that I don't see, and there's ways that that happens similar to what was happening here in this early church that, that, that a lot of people here in this church don't see. There's, I know of some needs that have been expressed and met um, just very directly. Somebody had a need and somebody else heard, found out about that or heard about that and, and paid for that need, or even let somebody move in with them, right? We have a few of those. Um, and that kind of sounds like 
similar to those who believed were together and had all things in common. That's kind of saying, well, what's mine isn't just mine, but I, I share it with the, somebody who, um, who it would also be of benefit to. Um, many of y'all give tithes or give um, financial offerings to the church, which are meeting needs, certainly meeting my needs. It's meeting other needs, whether you know it or not. There's um, the needs that come up that that actually goes towards meeting. Not to mention, like not, not just financial, but you can think even beyond that, there's countless um, ways that we have come to each other's aid selflessly that I've seen in you all that express togetherness, that I'm giving up time and energy and, and resources to help meet the needs of those in our church. Um, and I think that's a cool application of these types of ideas of togetherness. Um, I think, of course, we have a lot of room to grow and we can be challenged and stretched in this. But the reason for this togetherness that we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more we grow to appreciate the gospel as individuals, um, the more, I believe, together we will be. The great North Hollywood refrigerator swap, for example, happens not because we're trying to do something fascinating or because we're gritting our teeth and trying to be together, but it happened because we happened to be unified and that was a small way we could express our, our unity in the, the mission and, and the gospel um, that God has, has done for us. So I wanted to kind of just point that out um, as we end here, that the, the gospel, what Jesus has done, produces in us, in the church, a togetherness that then produces this kind of living, okay? Um, or, or whatever that looks like specifically in our context. It's tempting to read these verses like I've wanted to do in the past and just say, that's really cool, let's figure out how we can do that and forget about what kind of binds it all together um, in, in the beginning, the, the unity that we find in the gospel. So. I think that a good starting step for us to ask and like just for us to consider tonight is are we truly together and growing in togetherness and kind of a, a part of that is is the gospel more important to us than our stuff is the gospel more important to us than my stuff or your stuff individually because we can like look at verses 44 and 45 and try to muster up a bunch of generosity for each other, but eventually that's going to go horribly wrong if we aren't actually in unity. And somebody's going to say, okay, well, I feel like this is what Acts 2 church did, so I'm going to have to give this to so-and-so because they have a need. And then you watch that person blow that money, and then you're upset, and the frustration, the bitterness builds. And But it's because the, the unity maybe wasn't there um, to begin with. So is the gospel the most important thing to us as individuals. And if it is, then that togetherness, that um, expression of that togetherness and generosity, it, it will happen. We'll figure out ways to make it happen. Um, but we won't have to be saying, hey, you need to be more generous, and you need to give more, and you need to do this. But we'll be like the Macedonians. We'll be begging earnestly to participate in the relief of the saints or other needs that we see, because we understand how great the gospel message is. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I don't know if I share it here a lot or not, but I think it's worth us just kind of ending, uh, just meditating, considering this verse. Um, this is a verse in the couple of chapters that Paul talks to the Corinthians a lot about giving. He talks about the Macedonians and this collection that's being taken for Jerusalem and all this stuff. Um, and it's, it seems to be Paul's primary motivation for encouraging the Corinthian church in, in their generosity um, and in being together, even with another local church, not even their own necessarily. Um, and I think that our, our growing in our understanding of this is this, what the verse I'm about to share is, is the only thing that's really gonna get us to a really pure, um, unity together that expresses itself in a unique but, but really cool way that the onlooking world, like we're going to talk about next week, they actually see something and that's, that's a witness in and of itself, our, our unity with each other and our 
um, caring for each other. But I think that this is the only thing that's going to get us there. And before I read the verse, I'll say this too. Like as I think through the the applications of how can we live something like this out as a church, it makes me nervous because I think, well, I have a lot of nice stuff that I really like, and I there's there's a part of me in my flesh that thinks, well, I don't want to. I'll live like I have some things in common. Like you can share my tap water, but like I've got some <laughs> nice guitars, and you know. Um, and so it, it, it's not just some easy thing to think about, well, what does it look like to, to consider that everything that I have can be used for the sake of other people? Um, until I, I consider what I think the first church clearly understood and that I think we should be reminded of. And it's in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, one of my favorite verses. It says this, and I'm going to read it a couple times because it, it's amazing. And it leads to all sorts of things in our life. Um, Paul says this. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. He says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. We know how he did that so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. When we consider the grace of our Lord Jesus, I, I wonder what our appropriate response to that would be. And it's not necessarily, oh, I'm nervous that I might have to give up something for the sake of somebody else. The more we understand and believe and revel in the gospel, the less we're going to say, like a two-year-old, that's mine, that's mine, right? But the more together we'll, we'll be as we understand the grace of the Lord Jesus, the gospel that he's called us to, and we're together in that. So let me pray, and uh, then if you guys have questions or thoughts, we'll follow up with that. Um, Father, thank you for the example of this really cool group of believers that um, the, the church as we know it kind of started out with thank you that we can see evidence that there was um, something so much bigger going on than people chasing after their own dreams for themselves or, or their families or some kind of material gain but thank you that you show in them a, a desire to prioritize right and to, um, to follow you at all costs and with joy man it's so amazing um, to, to read of people who joyfully, many of them, um, would sacrifice what they have to meet the needs of others because they're on the same team. They're in the same kingdom, the kingdom of God. And uh, so thank you for that encouragement, Lord. I pray that we would be challenged, not made nervous or <laughs> um, concerned, but that we would be excited about what that could mean and, and could continue to mean in this church as we uh, lovingly care for each other for the sake of the gospel and the proclamation of the gospel and what that gospel does in our life and the witness that that can have. Um, so help us to apply this, Lord. And then when we get down in the nitty gritty of figuring out well, specifically how can we do this as a church and how can we um, care for the needs within the church well, um, I pray that you give us wisdom in that too. Um, so thanks, Lord, for this. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>